Hello, I'm Betsy Schwarm. November 26th, 2021, we bid farewell to Stephen Sondheim, one of the greatest talents the world of musical theater has ever seen, or perhaps ever will see. Let us take time to remember his gifts, his contributions to the field, and all the music that he has planted into the hearts of audience members and performers alike. Remembering Sondheim, samples from his music, and perspectives on his life. Attend the tale of Sweeney Todd. As a prologue, let's consider what makes musical theater distinct from opera or operetta. All three are stage dramas using the singing voice and instruments and sets and props and costumes and stage action to present a story to the audience. It may be a bright and cheerful story or a dark and tragic story. There's no rule that you have to go one way or you have to go the other. But the music needs to serve the story and ideally be intriguing and involving on its own. In an opera, everything is sung all the way through. There is not spoken dialogue. Operetta has spoken dialogue amidst the musical numbers. So does musical theater. And in fact, operetta and musical theater are more or less the same art form. Operetta, however, is a term that was being used back in the 19th century and the very early 20th century. It came to be considered a bit old-fashioned in tone, and so musical theater became the preferred term, especially in Broadway. Isn't it rich? Are we a pair? Sondheim's works are musical theater, not opera. They do contain spoken dialogue, a fact that has not prevented opera companies from wishing to present Sondheim's works, especially the dark and demented drama of Sweeney Todd. After all, Sondheim's works are so well crafted in and of themselves that they benefit from a higher level of vocal craftsmanship, such as what opera companies are accustomed to presenting. So Sweeney Todd is one of the Sondheim works to prove that opera companies and musical theater companies can kind of cross-pollinate one another. And Sondheim was the perfect man to bridge that gap. You're so nice. You're not good, you're not bad. You're just nice. I'm not good, I'm not nice. I'm just right. I'm the rich. You're the world. Sondheim filled a crucial place in the development of English language musical theater, especially in the United States and on Broadway, but not exclusively, as his approach to musical theater made a difference on the world scene as well. Sondheim began to write pieces of musical theater that were not relying upon being light, bright love stories where all works out well. He also was fascinated with the concept of darker central characters don't necessarily make the hero someone you would like to sit down and have coffee with, but rather someone who is intriguing in and of himself, such as, for example, Sweeney Todd. We don't want to meet Sweeney, but he did make a fascinating centerpiece for the musical theater work of Sondheim's that bears his name. Sondheim was also a standout in one very particular fact that without exception, he was writing not only the music, but also the lyrics and occasionally the spoken lines to go with the work as well. Very few prominent opera composers have been both composers and librettists. Mozart wasn't, Verdi wasn't, Puccini wasn't. All of them found specialists of the written word to provide words for them to set to music. There were some composers who were also their own librettists, Frenchman Hector Berlioz, very famously the German composer Richard Wagner, perhaps less famously the Italian opera composer Ruggiero Leoncavallo. Chronologically speaking, Sondheim comes next, but he isn't the last. Lin-Manuel Miranda of Hamilton fame also writes both the words and the music for his productions. It's not only more time-consuming to do it that way, but it also puts demands upon the breadth of one's skills. A music specialist is not necessarily a word specialist. A word specialist quite likely can't deal with the music. But Sondheim and Miranda and Berlioz and Wagner and Leon Cavallo, but hardly anyone else, was able to take on the whole package and keep the entire creative scene within their own imagination, creating a work which is uniquely their own. 
Sondheim was born and raised on Manhattan's Upper West Side. His father was a clothing manufacturer, not doing the sewing himself, but owning the company. Mom was a dress designer, and they divorced when Stephen was 12. He was an only child and found himself gravitating to friends of the family, which in this context was friends of mom as dad went off on his own adventures. And two of Stephen Sondheim's family friends from childhood have very famous last names, Mary Rogers and James Hammerstein. Yes, as in Rogers and Hammerstein. In his adolescence, Stephen Sondheim spent much time, especially at the Hammerstein home. Mrs. Hammerstein was a good friend of Mrs. Sondheim. And Stephen lingered frequently at the Hammerstein home, talking about music with Father Oscar, and talking even more about words. As Oscar Hammerstein II was not a composer. He worked with composers, writing lyrics for their music, providing lyrics in advance of them writing the music very frequently. And Sondheim, being a literary and musically inclined young man, was interested in both sides of that equation. He was 15 when Rodgers and Hammerstein's second collaboration, Carousel, came to the stage and was invited to join the Hammerstein family and some of the Rogerses as well, specifically Mary Rogers, the daughter, in attending a preview performance of Carousel. Mary remembered later in her own memoirs that she was sitting right next to Stephen Sondheim, they had adjacent seats, and that in the more emotionally compelling scenes that young Stephen would be weeping into the shoulder of her coat. She remarked to her father, the kid really gets it. He understands music, Dad. Rogers and Hammerstein became the very principal early musical inspirations for Stephen Sondheim. In that same year as the premiere of Rogers and Hammerstein's Carousel, young Sondheim sat down with Hammerstein for a lengthy discussion on the art of writing words for Broadway. Sondheim was only 15 at the time, but Hammerstein had known him for some years and had plenty of opportunity to discover that the kid had a gift for both music and words. During their discussion, Hammerstein outlined for the youth a four-part curriculum, assignments of increasing difficulty to give young Sondheim experience in crafting lyrics and even the book, the dialogue of a musical, how to write a musical from a word point of view, as opposed to the music point of view. In 1994, almost 50 years later, Sondheim was interviewed by James Lipton, host of Inside the Actors Studio, to talk about life and career on Broadway. Sondheim made a point of giving some credit to Hammerstein for getting him off to a good start, and of describing what that curriculum had been. What was it that Hammerstein felt one needed to know to write words for Broadway? Here's an excerpt from that interview. He also, as I recall, outlined for you a curriculum, because you were young, yeah. and he told you he wanted you to write four things. It was sort of like a wonderful fairy tale, uh, 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 a fairy godmother who doesn't make, give you four wishes, but makes four demands of you. What were they? He said, he outlined a course for me after, after this extraordinary afternoon when I was 15. He said, over the next few years, he said, first, take, take a play that, that you like and that you think is good and musicalize it. In musicalizing it, you'll get to know it very well and get to analyze it. So then take a play that you think is good but flawed, that you think could be improved, and musicalize that. And then he said, then take a non-play, something that somebody else has written, it can be a novel, short story, but not a play, not something that has been structured dramatically for the stage, and musicalize that. And then he said, then try an original. And over the next five years, it took me till the year after I got out of college, as a matter of fact, I did just that. The first, first one I did, pardon me, was a um, play by George Kaufman and Mark Connolly called Beggar on Horseback, which lends itself very well to musicalization because it's essentially a long fantasy. And the second one, which I couldn't get permission for, was played by Maxwell Anderson that won the Pulitzer Prize called High Tour 
which I liked, but which I thought was sort of clumsy. And so I did that. And then I did a series of short stories called Mary Poppins. And I couldn't solve that because I couldn't, I'd never finished it because I couldn't figure out how to take a series of disparate short stories, even though the characters existed through them, and make an evening, make, make a structure, make an arc. And then I wrote an original after that. The original one was? It was called Climb High. And uh, there was a, <coughs> a motto on the um, stone steps that Williams said, climb high, climb far, your, uh, aim the sky, your goal the star. And I thought, gee, that's very Hammerstein-ish. <laughs> <laughs> It was as a lyricist, not as a composer, that Stephen Sondheim first made a splash on Broadway. And a big splash it was as part of the creative team for West Side Story in 1957. Leonard Bernstein was, as we all know, the composer of West Side Story. But Bernstein did not write his own words. Stephen Sondheim wrote the lyrics. Arthur Lawrence wrote what they call the book, that is, the spoken dialogue. And the choreography was by Jerome Robbins. All the gentlemen were early in their careers, so perhaps they were the perfect creative team for the tale that is West Side Story with so many young characters in the action. The piece was a smash hit. Not just Bernstein's music, but Sondheim's lyrics. The entire production was widely admired, hugely adored. And there was a strong thought that it will surely win the Tony Award that year. It didn't. That went to The Music Man, a very different piece set in Iowa, not in New York City. But it was at least a worthy competitor. Let's sample some of the music and lyrics from West Side Story with a song somewhere. In the original production, it was not sung by the character of Anita, who was played by Rita Moreno. However, in the 2021 remake of the film, one on which Sondheim himself was a consultant. It was sung by Rita Moreno, who was back not in her original role as Rita, but as Tony's employer at the drugstore. Rita Moreno and somewhere, yes, the music is Bernstein's, the lyrics, all the words are Sondheim's. There's a place for us Somewhere a place for us Peace and quiet and open air Wait for us somewhere There's a time for us Someday
But West Side Story is an example from the Sondheim catalog in which he provided only the lyrics, not the music. Within another few years, however, he would be writing music and lyrics for his own pieces of musical theater, collaborating with someone to write the book, the spoken text, bringing in directors to run the show, but Sondheim handling two different sides of the creative process. The earliest such Sondheim work was a great success for someone who was taking his first endeavor on both sides of the equation. A funny thing happened on the way to the forum from 1962. In the original cast, Zero Mustel was playing the character of Pseudolus, the slave who wins his freedom by the end of the story, and it is he who sings the song Comedy Tonight. Playgoers, I bid you welcome. The theater is a temple, and we are here to worship the gods of comedy and tragedy. Tonight, I am pleased to announce a comedy. We shall employ every device we know in our desire to divert you. Something familiar, something peculiar, something for everyone, a comedy tonight. Something appealing, something appalling, something for everyone, a comedy tonight. Nothing with kings, nothing with crowns, bring on the lovers, liars and clowns. Old situations, new complications, nothing portentous or polite. Tragedy tomorrow, comedy tonight. Something convulsive, ah! something repulsive, yeah. something for everyone, a, a comedy, comedy tonight. Something aesthetic, something frenetic, something for everyone, a, a comedy, comedy tonight. Nothing with gods, nothing with fate. Weighty affairs will just have to wait. Nothing that's formal, nothing that's normal. No recitations to recite. Open up the curtain. Something erratic, something dramatic, something for everyone, a comedy tonight. Frenzy and frolic, strictly symbolic, something for everyone, a comedy tonight. Every few years thereafter, Sondheim would present a work first on Broadway and then on tour, for which he had crafted both music and lyrics. In some cases, the combination of music and lyrics was so striking that individual numbers from the work took on a life of their own well beyond Broadway. Consider Sondheim's 1973 hit, A Little Night Music. Indeed, the title suggests Mozart, though the tale was borrowed from film director Ingmar Bergman's Smiles of a Summer Night from 1955. Set on a country estate in Sweden, the tale concerns several contrasting, often intertwined love stories, and in Sondheim's version, a particularly familiar and beloved song. Isn't it rich? Are we a pair? Indeed, it is Send in the Clowns. In the context of the story, the song is given to Desiree, a famed stage actress who, having achieved professional triumph, though without winning the love of her heart, 
is reflecting on the course of her life. Countless mezzo-sopranos from opera and musical theater have reveled in both the beauty of the song and the richness of the role. Pop singer Judy Collins brought it to particular fame. However, let us hear a performance from a 1994 celebration of Sondheim's career. Why this performance? The singer is Angela Lansbury, who in the original production of Sweeney Todd had sung the role of pie maker Mrs. Lovett. Her accompanist, Sondheim himself. Isn't it rich? Are we a pair? Me here at last on the ground, you in midair, sending the clown. Tearing around One who can't move Where are the clowns? Send in the clowns Just when I'd start Opening doors Finally knowing The one that I wanted Was yours Making my entrance again with my usual flair sure of my lines no one is there don't you love a farce my fault I fear I thought that you'd want what I want Sorry, my dear But where are the clowns? Quick, send in the clowns Don't bother, they're here Isn't it rich? Isn't it queer Losing my timing this late In my career And where are the clowns There ought to be clowns Well, maybe next year reasonable to talk about Sondheim and focus only on Send in the Clowns when many of his other productions are a critical part of the Broadway catalog. Must have Sweeney Todd for Sondheim. And let us hear the song Pretty Woman from the 1979 original cast recording with Len Carew in the title role of Sweeney Todd. Pretty Women Fascinating Sipping coffee, dancing pretty women are a wonder. Pretty women sitting in the window, standing on the stair, something in them. Within you, Glancing. stay forever, breathing lightly. Pretty women, pretty, pretty women, women, blowing out, blowing out their candles, candles or combing out, combing their, out their hair, hair. Even, when even when 
Watching how they made a man sing from far as you're living. Pretty women, sir. Pretty women, yes. Pretty women, pretty women, pretty women. Five years later, Sondheim imagined a very different sort of story, not a murderous barber, but rather the creative process by which an artist does his work. And he turns to a very famous painting by George Surratt and presents in the course of the musical how a painter, or one supposes a musical artist, would gradually put together what he or she is attempting to capture in an expressive artistic form. It was Sunday in the Park with George, a Pulitzer Prize winning work from 1984 and let us hear the ensemble scene Sunday with the original cast which included Mandy Patinkin in the character of George Surratt and also Bernadette Peters as his sweetheart and a variety of others appearing as the characters the figures in the painting and therefore on the stage given stage life to Sweeney Todd and then to George Surratt and company, Sondheim decided to look a bit further afield for new inspiration and found it in fairy tales. Many, many fairy tales have made their way to Broadway. But what Sondheim wanted to do was combine characters from different stories, have them intersect with one another and see their personalities from a different perspective, that it isn't all a fairy tale and there isn't always a happy ending. Enter Into the Woods in 1987 with the song The Last Midnight. The film version of Into the Woods featured Meryl Streep as the witch. And here she is with The Last Midnight. It's the last midnight. It's the last verse. Now before it's past midnight, I'm leaving you my last curse. I'm leaving you alone. Tend the garden, it's yours, separate and alone. Everybody down on all fours. All right, mother. When? Lost the means again. Punish me the way you did that. Give me clothes and a hunt. Just away from this bunch and the gloom and the doom and the burn.
Stephen Sondheim had an unusually long career in Broadway, particularly given how prominent his contributions to the Broadway world continued to be. He had first appeared on Broadway as the lyricist for West Side Story in 1957, and he was still working on Broadway. Sondheim was still creating new works for Broadway at the turn of the century. Yes, the turn of the 21st century. And his last completed show was Roadshow of 2003. The story was set roughly a century earlier at the beginning of the 20th century and tells of Addison Misner and his brother Wilson, who were apparently very adventurous souls. They were real people. They did make their way up to the Klondike gold strike in Alaska and make their way back to Florida to get involved in its real estate boom in the 1920s. That much of the story is factually based, but not the entire tale as it is told in Roadshow. And one of its most gorgeous musical numbers is a bit of fiction. It is a duet, the best thing that's ever happened, which in this case is nothing that actually ever happened in the lives of either brother. It is a love duet for two men for one of the brothers and his imagined male lover. The best thing that's ever happened. You are the best thing that ever has happened to me. You are. Okay then, one of the best things that's happened to me. You are. They say we all find love. I never bought it I never thought it would happen to me Who could foresee You are the goddamnedest thing that has happened to me ever When did I have this much happiness happen to me? Never I can't believe my luck And all I can do Is be the best thing that's happened to you So what do you say we just stay home? What do you say we just go out on the boat And get smashed and make love on the beach And stare up at the moon? <laughs> Holly might just be the best thing that has happened to me so far. Of course, not much ever really has happened to me <laughs> so far. I didn't much like love. I always fought it. I never thought it would happen like this. Give us a kiss We may just be the best thing that has happened to us Kiddo, partner Another moment like this may not happen to us Partner, lover When all is said and done I have to agree that's happened to me Who knew Who dreamed Beats me Roadshow was Sondheim's last completed work. It did reach the public in a short run in the dramatic theaters, but he did not hang up his musical knowledge at that point. He continued to work from time to time, especially advising other composers about what they might try in their works, and set to work on one last piece of his own. Square One, in 2021. Sondheim had just turned 91 years old and thought he wanted to do a bit more in the world of musical theater. Perhaps the title Square One was a reference to maybe go back to the beginning and take on some of the ideas he hadn't had the opportunity to do originally. September 16th of 2021, Stephen Sondheim appeared on Late Night with Stephen Colbert and spoke with him about the production. He had hopes that he would be making progress with it, 
but alas he would at that point have only a couple more months of time left to him still a long career that has proven fulfilling and satisfying for audiences hopefully for stephen sondheim himself as well even in his late years when his new works were not coming as quickly from his pen to the stage sondheim continued to have an enduring influence in the world of musical theater mentoring the next generation rather in the way that hammerstein the second had mentored him providing ideas and advice and coaching in how to make the words work with the music how to get the music to work with the words and perhaps how to produce both the music and the words oneself in the course of his long career stephen sondheim received numerous awards and commendations for his achievements nine tony awards including one for lifetime achievement eight Grammys for original cast recordings, a Pulitzer Prize for drama in 1984 for Sunday in the Park with George, the Academy Award in 1991 for his song Sooner or Later, which he contributed to the film Dick Tracy. It was sung at that time by Madonna. Sondheim did not write the full film score, but certainly that song, which was awarded the Academy Award for Best Song. Kennedy Center honors came his way in 1993. He was voted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame in 1999 and received a Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2015 from President Barack Obama. Stephen Sondheim is admired not just by audiences who love to hear his music and by performers who adore the chance to bring it to life, but also by the broader performing arts community in recognition for the genius that he brought to this particular art form. Let us regret that there will be no more new Sondheim works, but all the existing Sondheim will continue to reward us in its excellence and its ability to touch us and fulfill our evenings of musical theater. I'm Betsy Schwarm. Thank you so much for joining me for this remembrance of the artistry of Stephen Sondheim. Isn't it rich? Isn't it queer Losing my timing this late In my career And where are the clowns There ought to be clowns Well, maybe next year